When I met Joseph 15 years ago, he was wearing jeans, a t-shirt, and a multicolored African hat with a picture of King Tut. He was eating grapes out of a plastic bag as he told me his harrowing tale of survival and the MacGyver-like ingenuity he used to escape from his New Orleans neighborhood in the immediate aftermath of Hurricane Katrina. It's a story that you can never imagine. It all started out with a hurricane. The next thing I know, after the wind, then the water came down. Then I was sitting there kicking the door down, iron door in order to make a raft, so I decided to sit there and grab two ties and a hose pipe. So that was my boat. When the night fell, I had to sit there and take a car battery, kick the headlights out, speaker wires, and taped it up, make my own flashlight. The way he talked, nonchalantly listing off everything that had happened, kind of gave me the sense that he'd told his story a million times and was starting to grow tired of it. Like he'd repeated the chain of events for so many people, that it now seemed almost as if this had happened to someone else. And it goes on by losing the family right there on top of the bridge on Claiborne and Orleans. And they got separated. But in the process of that, I'm in the water five days and four nights looking for them. Going from the Superdome, finding bodies floating in the water, to the convention center, from the convention center to the bus station where they lose it. And I just say, I got to get up out of here because it was was real, real hectic. Joseph and other New Orleans residents boarded a bus bound for Dallas, Texas. But once they arrived, as he put it, they found out there were too many humbuggers already there. So the bus turned north on I-35 and kept traveling. It eventually dropped them off with about 1,500 other evacuees at Camp Gruber, a military base in the tiny town of Braggs, Oklahoma, which is where I happened to meet him. Joseph found his brother-in-law's phone number when he was cleaning out his wallet, and through a series of calls, he eventually discovered that the rest of his family had been transported to Colorado. When I spoke with him, he was planning on returning to New Orleans to check on the condition of his property, but he wasn't very hopeful. Was your home damaged pretty bad then? 14 foot of water. Houses stacked on top of houses, cars just underwater, oil floating. Oh, it's a total wreck. This is Far From Home. I'm Scott Gurian, and you probably missed it amid everything else going on in the world recently, but last week was the 15th anniversary of Hurricane Katrina. So on this episode, we're staying within the U.S. for a change and going to New Orleans. Now, let me start off by saying I know Katrina might seem like an event that happened a long time ago that has little relevance to the present day, but I think there are actually a lot of parallels. You see, if COVID-19 has reminded us of anything these past few months, it's that when a catastrophic event occurs, it's the poor and vulnerable who often suffer the most, which is something we also saw after Katrina. The other thing is that during normal times when all is well, we like to believe that we could put our trust in our government, our elected leaders and societal institutions to be there to give a helping hand if things ever get bad. We assume the folks in charge know what they're doing and have our backs. But all too often when those systems are actually put to the test during a major disaster, we realize they're not equipped to handle the scale of the problem and many people end up having to figure things out on their own. You've probably heard about the difficulties many doctors and nurses have experienced during this pandemic, trying to get adequate supplies of essential equipment like gloves, ventilators, hospital gowns, and face masks. During Katrina, it was stories of government incompetence, inadequate shelters, and elderly nursing home residents left to fend for themselves. Katrina left lasting footprints on New Orleans that may never be erased. But unfortunately, I think that for many of us who don't live on the Gulf Coast of the United States, those events have now faded into history. The thing is, this is something we need to remember. From the federal government's botched response to the lessons about the ongoing threats of climate change to simply honoring the memories of the thousands of people who died, it's a historical event we should never forget. So on today's show, I'm going back in time to August of 2007 when I visited New Orleans and had conversations with several people who were struggling to rebuild their lives and reclaim this once great American city as their home. Let's start with Sophie Johnson. 
She'd grown up in Oklahoma City, but had fallen in love with New Orleans over the course of numerous trips to visit her older sister, who went to Tulane University. So Sophie decided to enroll as a student just down the street at Loyola. It was the end of the summer after her sophomore year, and she was driving back to school from her parents' home in Oklahoma with her sister and one of her friends. And on the way down, we heard on the radio that a hurricane was coming, but hurricanes come all the time, so we just kind of were like, okay, we'll drive down there and we'll see what happens. And then my mom called and was like, okay, you really need to leave. It's really getting close. So we called a bunch of my friends, and we all drove to Florida where my grandma lives. And we stayed with her while we were evacuating. When I met Sophie in the front yard of her former apartment two years later, the hurricane's effects were still visible. This was in the Claiborne University District of Uptown New Orleans, an area of relative high ground that had never experienced serious flooding in the past. I mean, sure, Sophie told me with a smile. There had been a few times when there was enough water on her street following a heavy rainfall that she and her roommates would have fun floating down the block on an air mattress. But prior to Katrina, it never really seemed like much of a concern. As was the case with many houses in this neighborhood, Sophie's first floor entrance was purposely built three feet above the ground to protect it from flooding. But Katrina presented challenges for which few people had prepared. No one expected the levees would fail and things would be quite this bad, at least not in this part of the city. My parents came back to empty out my house. And I mean, just even seeing the pictures with the water line and everything below it that is just destroyed is your stuff. And you can kind of pick up pieces of what that used to be or what it was. The floodwaters here rose about six feet from the street, which meant about three feet of standing water in Sophie's apartment. The building's owner, Mark Johnson, lived just above her on the second floor. Unfortunately, I hate to say this in front of Sophie, when that water hit, it really took all their stuff, and we had to bring it out. And so all you had to do was stack it on the street. And so uh, their pile of their stuff reached up to here. Way above. Yeah, yeah. about five or six feet. Yeah, so when you stack it up, and then the worst was the mattresses. And my father-in-law had to help me carry out the mattresses and stuff. But they get waterlogged because they're just laying there. And when you try to lift a mattress that's been basically underwater, oh, man, those things are nasty. And then, uh, like, some of your plastic totes, mm-hmm. they rose up when the water hit them, but then they hit the bed and they couldn't get any higher, so water filled them in. And so when we pulled them out, the water had been sitting there in a month. And, oh, man, did it have such an aroma about it. It was yeah. like, oh, man. Mm-hmm. We took Vic's vapor rub when you came back and you just kept putting it in your nose so you wouldn't have to smell the stench that was going on. Sophie's parents rented an 18-passenger van, filled it up with whatever of her belongings they could salvage, and drove back to Oklahoma City. She then spent the next several months going through everything, cleaning it off and getting sick from breathing in all that mold. Sophie returned to New Orleans for the first time four months after the storm to start her spring semester, and she said entering the city was absolutely terrifying. There were almost no streetlights, there were almost no street signs, there were National Guardsmen sitting by their tanks holding guns on the edges of street corners, and I was driving into town getting off the highway, and I didn't recognize the streets. I had to call my friend and be like, okay, I'm here, how do I get to your house? I don't know where I'm going. It was a very, very weird feeling. And she found there were other ways that the city she returned to was different from the one she had left. No one was normal. No one expected you to return to normal. My teachers would cry in class. Everyone had been affected in a different way. And it was hard because being someone who lost my house and my stuff, if you lived in the dorms, your stuff wasn't damaged. So a lot of people had experienced having to be in another place and like, mourning for the city, but not for themselves personally. And so that was kind of a hard thing to deal with because it's even hard not to be jealous when other people have their stuff and you don't have anything and you're just like, I remember when I had a laptop. I remember when, you know. We stepped inside so Sophie could show me the gutted remains of where she used to live. The walls had been removed and all that remained were nails, wooden beams, and some workman's tools. This was the big living room. That was the side living room. That's the kitchen. Um, This was my room. And that was my bathroom. And then that was my roommate Danny's room. The other bathroom was right there. And then my sister's bedroom is the far back one right there. 
pretty different than what you remember it looking like. Yeah, it seems a lot smaller. I mean, the first time I came in here after the walls had been ripped out, I couldn't even tell where my room was. <laughs> and so Sandy, the upstairs landlord, kind of had to walk me around and show me, okay, that was that room, that was that room. No one's ever seen a house they lived in, like, as the frames. It's really, it's an awkward feeling. <laughs> If you're in the places where people come to visit, life is very quickly returning to normal, but you drive down the wrong road or you turn and it's all abandoned homes with the orange X's on them. And it's just very weird from area to area how completely different it is. I'm obviously horribly upset by what's happened to me, but when you go and look at other areas, you can't even be upset. I mean, there are people who've lost their lives. Like, compared to that, you're just so fortunate that you can't even stop to realize how upset you are because at least you weren't in that situation. At least I had a car and I was able to leave the city. At least I had someone to take me in when I needed to leave, and things really did just work out way better than <laughs> they did for many, many people. When I go to other places, it's still really hard. Even going home, when I meet someone new and I'm like, oh yeah, I live in New Orleans, they're just like, why? And that, I mean, that's a hard thing to hear. It's really hard to go other places and hear people say, I don't know why they're rebuilding that city. I don't know. It's your home. It's where my school is. It's where my friends are. It's an amazing city. It's so much a part of history. There's so many interesting things to do here. Like, you always want what was there. That's what you're used to. That's your normalcy. And when it's been taken away from you, especially so suddenly, like your instant urge is to rebuild that normalcy and to be able to get back to your life. And the fact that other people would question that doesn't even make sense to me. But while Sophie was trying as hard as she could to be optimistic, she told me she couldn't help but remain fearful. I love the city and I hope it becomes exactly what it should be, but... When I'm finished with school, I do think I'll move because something like that can happen once, but I really don't think I'd be able to handle it happening again. It's a hard reality to realize that it very easily could happen again. It's been over a decade since I recorded that interview, and New Orleans has yet to sustain another direct hit from a storm quite as powerful as Hurricane Katrina. But other parts of the Gulf Coast haven't been as lucky. Just a few weeks ago, Hurricane Laura made landfall near the Texas-Louisiana border, killing more than 30 people and causing widespread destruction totaling nearly $9 billion. Forecasters say the next few months will be an extremely active hurricane season with stronger, more frequent, and longer-lasting storms. And with climate change causing ocean temperatures to rise, that trend is expected to continue in the years ahead. You know, as I was putting this show together, I was thinking about how this whole experience of living through a global pandemic and not traveling these past six months has made me recognize now more than ever the importance and value of the place I call home. At times like this, it's a shelter from the scary and potentially dangerous world, a place of safety, familiarity, and comfort. I can't even begin to imagine what it must have been like for people like Sophie and the other 800,000 displaced New Orleans residents who no longer had a home to go to after Katrina. Hearing their stories again now in light of the recent events with COVID-19, I think I have a much greater appreciation for what they went through. Okay, so now let's change pace a bit. I want to tell you a story. This is a story about New Orleans. Cause down here no one is that important. Here's a little story about this. Here's a little story about Oklahoma City native and New Orleans transplant Jeff Shambliss. I moved down here mainly because you don't see the type of shows in Oklahoma City as you would here. 
Um, I came down here actually during the New Year's party for 2000, and it wasn't the party that got me here, it was more seeing all the uh, telephone poles with all the shows and stuff that were coming through New Orleans, whereas Oklahoma City didn't get the variety. Shambliss started making connections in the local hip-hop community, and within three years he'd started his own label, Media Darling Records. The label was doing very well. Um, We did a big tour in 2005 with Galactic, which is a local funk band here, which was very successful for us. We went out for three and a half weeks, which was great. We finished out our few tours and, you know, we had a lot of money invested in the label. We were about to release three albums and a month after we had the plans to do all this stuff, you know, the storm happened. And I was actually in Shreveport, Louisiana doing a show Um, So I got stuck, so I couldn't come back. From there, I went home to Oklahoma for a week or so and then decided um, to move out to California. I went out to San Francisco for a while, stayed out there for about six months, and then I came back to try to do some sort of rebuilding and see where the city was. And it was it was rough. It was rough. Four or five of the people that we were working with are now in L.A., San Francisco, Colorado. Um, You know, a couple of the kids are still here, but still trying to catch up on money they lost from two years ago still. One of the main ones that we've been doing the whole time is uh, MC No One. You know, he's been the one that's been with us the longest. It was tough, man. I, you know, I left and came back, and I was the first one back from the crew. So for about six months, I was just trying to convince everybody to come back to New Orleans and keep the label alive. A lot of them had other options, and, and you know, a lot of them were a lot better off, too, where they ended up at. New Orleans isn't always the most hospitable place. Has it been a struggle to kind of get the label back on its feet? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Um, one of the main menus that we had worked with, um, Twy Ropa, and they had their ceiling fall in, you know, so the building's gone, people have moved on. Um, a lot of new faces at a lot of the new venues, so the people that we worked with before that knew us aren't around. The scene in New Orleans for a very long time, there, was, there weren't that many people. I mean, for the first year, maybe year and a half, there was, you know, a fifth of what the city was, and it made it a lot harder that the college kids weren't coming back, which was a big part of our audience. You know, we'd worked for years promoting the, the college campuses and getting a fan base around. And before the storm, our shows were to the point we didn't need to promote that much. You know, we had a show, people would come out. Now, it's hard to do a show once a month. People seem to be supporting more just the uh, drinking in New Orleans instead of the, you know, music scene itself. Content's actually gotten really good. The No One album is actually, you know, half of it is a lot of Katrina related. There's a lot of influences on there from local artists and, you know, experiences that had happened. So out of disasters come great things, you know. The first one I wrote after the storm was called Patch and Broken Dreams. It started out as a spoken word piece. So I put it to music and uh, I actually took a bunch of samples from news clips and news reels and that kind of thing from the footage of the storm and uh, spliced it all in there. Um, and I got some of the things from the, the convention center and from the stadium, just to make it that more personal. You know, I'm not telling my story during the song either. I'm telling just kind of the city's story and giving all points of view. So we were doing sound check at a show in Baton Rouge. The big screen behind the bar was playing the news. We weren't all that surprised by what was seen on the screen. That big red spiral headed straight for New Orleans. Seems to me that Mother Nature taunts us every season. So many New Orleanians are saying that they're never leaving. Even after water begins pouring through the ceiling, it isn't enough to create that pack up and run feeling. But something was different this time. The sky felt alive with that category five. It bumped up on the traffic the next day or two. Trying to drive and find a drier, higher ground and make it. So many people stay because they didn't want to leave. And far too many people stay because they didn't have the means to flee the flying debris. Still, we harbored hope. We thought we dodged a bullet until the levees broke. It's a very powerful medium. 
You look at a rapper's lyric page and you look at a singer's lyric page. A singer's lyrics may only be four or five lines, right? For a whole entire verse or even a song. Rappers' lyrics, they're very intricate with the descriptions. It's almost like, you know, you're actually writing out the story. There's a lot more to be said in a rap than there is in a regular song. And when there's that much going on and that many things that need to be said, and you want to be as exact as you can be in your description of it, I think hip hop is definitely the way to go. Hip-hop being such a new musical form, I mean, it's only been around, what, 30, 35 years as rap or hip-hop. I think if you New know, Orleans or any other type of problems are going to come around, it's been such a great medium to speak to younger kids. So that's who we want to be involved with is the younger crowds and our generation as well. Everyone we still have time to do something about these things right. that we talk about, you know what I mean? Like rappers call ourselves activists, but there are very few of us that actually get out there and do things. And so we kind of talk about it and hope that the true revolutionaries will be inspired to go do something about it. These days there's so many artists in New Orleans talking about Katrina, especially hip hop artists. So when, you know, when it comes down to, um, has it changed my music any? No, not necessarily. Um, it's given me a couple of really great tunes, you know what I mean? And, and uh, it's definitely helped me out as far as like dealing with the situation. Music is definitely cathartic. I don't know, I, I feel kind of like I have an obligation to stay and uh, you know, to help rebuild the scene, not only the city. Shame of a nation, call it what you will, but I still call it inspiration. Don't forget about us, the people of New Orleans, still down here making music and patching broken dreams. All the music in that segment was produced by Roan Smith, also known as MC No One. We also heard from Jeff Shambliss, the co-founder and manager of Media Darling Records. So throughout this episode, you might have noticed a recurring theme that most of the people I interviewed were tied in some way or another to the state of Oklahoma, which I know sounds kind of random, right? Well, the reason for that is because I originally gathered all this material back when I was a young reporter working as the news director at a public radio station just outside of Oklahoma City. When I was planning my trip to Louisiana, I sent an email to several thousand of our listeners asking for their suggestions of interesting New Orleans stories with connections to Oklahoma, and I got lots of great replies. One of them said, hey, you should meet my friend Stephen Hauser. So I decided to pay him a visit. How are you? What's going on, man? How you doing? I'm doing well. I'm Stephen. Yeah, I'm Scott. Good to meet you. Nice to meet you. Come on in. Yeah, dude. This is my house. We're about a block from the Mississippi River in the Irish Channel neighborhood of Uptown New Orleans. It's a district known for its narrow, tree-lined streets and tightly packed shotgun houses. As a kid growing up in Oklahoma City, Hauser would often come down to New Orleans in the summer to visit his aunt and uncle, and he remembered it always felt like a place he himself would like to live one day. Finally, after studying abroad in Spain and going to photography school in California, he got his chance. Three months after Hurricane Katrina, when many people were still leaving New Orleans, Hauser decided to move to the city. What he found was very different from the place that existed in his childhood memories. I remember driving in with my dad, and I remember driving through the rain over the swamps, you know, the Atchafalaya Basin and Whiskey Bay, and it was just a real, you know, ominous feeling. I remember pulling into New Orleans and seeing the darkness and the spotlights. And the song came on the radio very strangely. It was the song Ghost Town by The Specials, just at the right time, you know? And it was a really weird reintroduction to New Orleans post-Katrina. This town is coming like a ghost town. All the clubs are being closed down. Hauser 
Hauser at first volunteered rebuilding the city by gutting several houses before finding his true niche. Being a graduate of a photojournalism school, I felt that it was a time that needed to be captured. And that's what I've been trying to do, is capture the rebirth of the city. I mean, you see people who are here to help, people who are here to take advantage, people who are fed up. You see the character in people right now that you probably won't see in a lot of other cities because they haven't been through the same situation. Uh, Just tell me kind of more about what is it like being a photographer in New Orleans uh, now in the aftermath of the storm? It's been cool because I've really gotten a chance to get close with people more so than I would anywhere else. People are really willing to share their stories most of the time. And, I mean, the main thing that I've really gotten involved in has been the music. It's been really cool to see all these homegrown New Orleans musicians who got scattered throughout the country or just lost hope, didn't have gigs, to see them come back up. Framed photos of some of those musicians covered the white walls of Hauser's living room, along with pictures documenting the event with which New Orleans will forever be linked. This is a photo I took at the lakefront, and this is where the wall of water was, I don't even know how high. People got trapped in their attics, and you can see the refrigerator has been completely overturned. Um, There's mold on every single inch of wall. It's just a mess, and all I can think of is the smell. <laughs> that's a photo of the Ninth Ward. Taken from the air. Yeah, that's, I took that from a helicopter. I have a friend who's a helicopter pilot. That's a convenient thing to have if you're a photographer. That was before it had been cleaned up. The debris was still everywhere. I mean, it looked like an atomic bomb had gone off, really. What happened is um, you see this barge. It kind of looks like Noah's Ark. And it had slammed into the levee and just like a bathtub drain, just all the water went into the lower ninth ward. And these are all houses right here next to the levee and they're completely removed. Actually, they're not there. They're five blocks away. They've been swept over. I imagine there's kind of a tension between, you know, on the one hand, mm-hmm. uh, these people who live there wanting you to capture their images and um, get them out to the rest of the world. On the other hand, they don't want just tourists, people I, coming in. They get really upset when people drive through as tourists, which I completely understand because um, that's what the French Quarter is for, <laughs> you know. People feel like they're being exploited? Yeah, I think so. And uh, that's understandable, you know. I try not to go uninvited. And at this point, I don't ever want to put a camera in someone's face. If somebody wants to share their story with me, I guess the whole point of doing your legwork and meeting people is gaining the trust and having the respect for them. Photographer Stephen Hauser. So we've heard a range of stories about how Hurricane Katrina affected people, and I can't help but draw comparisons to the present day. In 2005, it was news footage of storm survivors standing on their rooftops waiting for helicopters to rescue them amid the rising floodwaters that put New Orleans in the world's spotlight. More recently, the story was that in the aftermath of Mardi Gras, New Orleans experienced the fastest growth of coronavirus cases in the world. Both events, Katrina and COVID, upended people's lives and brought negative attention upon the city, but At least the hurricane was an isolated regional disaster, so people in other parts of the country could chip in to help. Plus, the storm passed quickly, so residents could start cleaning up the damage right away and try to move on with their lives. Unfortunately, the current situation is much more prolonged and widespread. Money alone won't solve it, and it's not entirely clear when it will be over. The good news is that the number of new COVID cases in Louisiana appears to have dropped in recent weeks to less than half the 2,000 or so daily cases that were reported earlier this summer, but it's obviously way too early to celebrate. In fact, recent images of large groups of maskless people roaming Bourbon Street during Labor Day weekend have local officials bracing for another spike in the weeks to come. Well, this has all been pretty sad and disheartening, so... Let me leave you with a story that's a bit more upbeat. It's the unusual tale of a New Orleans woman whose doctor's office got destroyed during Hurricane Katrina, but then she got some help from an unexpected source, a chance encounter 
with a fertility doctor who happened to be visiting from Oklahoma. I'm uh, David Kallenberger. I'm program director of the Bennett Fertility Institute at Integris Baptist Medical Center. My name is Andy Knox, born and raised in New Orleans. I worked at Galatoire's, which is a very famous restaurant in New Orleans. And um, my husband and I were trying to get pregnant for about three years. I was seeing a fertility specialist. He came in one night and brought in a drug rep. Her name is Myra Crawford. And we just hit it off. She's like, your next go round, I'll give you your drugs. You know, I'll take care of that for you. And I was like, oh, well, well that's great, you know. We were in New Orleans meeting um, a friend of ours who happens to be a drug rep that uh, sells fertility drugs. And we were having breakfast at Galatoire's. And she had asked for Andy Knox to wait on us, who we assumed was a friend of hers. She knew she was having some fertility issues and was under a treatment of Fertility Institute in New Orleans that got wiped away in Katrina. She brought the Kallenbergers in, Jenny and David Kallenberger. I never met these people, only had met Myra just a few times and waited on them. And uh, we were talking about doing the in vitro fertilization. They started talking a little bit. And she said, well, you ought to go to Dr. Kallenberger's program in Oklahoma City because they have some best results in the country. And my wife then popped up and said, yeah, you can just stay with us if you come. And I looked at her kind of funny. Jenny, out of the blue, just met her, was like, well, yeah, you know, you can come up to Oklahoma and, and stay at our house. And David will do everything, you know, he'll do the whole thing for you. And I was just like, oh, OK, you know, and he kind of chimed in and said, well, yeah. If you'd like to send me your records, I'll be glad to go and, and give you my opinion of what you need to have done. So... She left, and I looked at my wife and said, do you realize what you just did? She said, she'd never take us up on that. Well, I actually sent my records to him. About a week later, I got a nice letter from Andy with her record and said, you're so kind to do this for me, and I've been looking you up on the Internet, and Myers right, you have really great results, and if your offer is sincere, I'd love to take you up on it. So I called Jenny, and I say, well, guess what? That little offer you made as a quip, you know, she's going to take us up on it. And so he said, well, you know, she's a friend of Myra's. And so, you know, called Myra and told her and said, so you know her pretty well? She goes, no, I really don't know her. She waits on me at Galatoire's and does a good job. It took me about two months to make the decision to actually go to a strange place. I had never been to Oklahoma, didn't know anyone there, to stay with some stranger um, and, and do this in vitro fertilization. And this isn't just a short visit. This is like a uh, three and a half week uh, visit by the time you start start she gets there and she has to stay after embryos are transferred and all and so I go okay it's gonna be real interesting you know everybody was like this is kind of weird you know you're staying at his house and I've never had a patient stay with this before unless it was a relative or something everybody's like why is this doctor doing this I'm like oh, I don't know long story short over time she and Jenny my wife got to be really close and good friends and spent time in the kitchen cooking together and sharing recipes and she underwent IVF Came home about seven days later, took the pregnancy test, and found out that both eggs took five and a half weeks. We did an ultrasound, found out that it was twins, but we saw something else. And then nine and a half weeks, it was triplets. Well, it started off as a very weird situation that ended up being a very positive um, event. I think about these people every day. They're such a big part of my life. I mean... I have three babies because of them. Jenny, at the initial part, when I said, well, we're really going to have these guests, she goes, well, that can be our payback for, uh, to Katrina. My son's name is Callan, after Dr. Callenberger. My middle daughter's name is Emma, which is a family name. And Ava is actually uh, Dr. Callenberger's niece. Uh, Jenny just sent her a uh, shower gift, and it has these little baby things kids wear. It has their name on the front and on the, over the butt, has made in Oklahoma. Dr. David Kallenberger works at the Bennett Fertility Institute at Integris Baptist Medical Center in Oklahoma City, and Andy Knox is a former waitress at Galatoire's Restaurant on Bourbon Street in New Orleans. Thanks to my colleagues at KGOU Radio in Norman, Oklahoma, where a version of this episode originally ran, as well as to my editors at This American Life, which also aired a version of this last story many years ago. Remember, you could follow Far From Home on Facebook or Instagram, where I've posted photos this week of all the people you heard interviewed in the show. You could also follow me on Twitter at Scott Gurian and drop me a line or send me feedback at info at farfromhomepodcast.org. 
Thanks to Katie McGee and Jessica Williams for editorial assistance. My show's logo comes from Polemic, which designs award-winning experiences all over the world at the intersection of culture, commerce, and community. Find out how they could help your business at polemicdesign.com. Until next time, thanks for listening.